The 1960s ushered in a time of epistemological crisis, an era that continues today in which no merely human construction of reality could be trusted. The need to find something to believe in became appallingly urgent. Psychedelics provided many with something to believe in, something that seemed to transcend, transcend human constructions. But what sort of belief was this? I read the uh, movie um, The Truman Show as a parable of the artist in search of transcendental consciousness, and I'm, I'm sort of proposing it as an, as an allegory of how artists think and how they're trained these days. Truman Burbank, played by Jim Carrey, lives in a completely artificially constructed world, a per perfect sunny town called Sea Haven. Unbeknownst to him, he was adopted by an entertainment corporation shortly after birth and made the subject of a reality TV show broadcast to millions around the world. Thousands of hidden tr cameras track his every move. All the people in his world are actually actors. Only Truman does not know that nothing here is, quote, real. Two problems arise, however. He's getting bored um, and restless. He wants to go to Fiji. Over the years, the show's producers have tried to instill in him a fear of leaving home and traveling, but still he yearns for something beyond his ordinary existence, which he is beginning to notice is, be, is appearing to be more and more repetitious. One day, a, um, a stage light falls from the sky into the street. The newspaper reports that it is, it is a landing light from a passing airplane, but his suspicions have been aroused. Something seems not right. He begins to look at his world with a more critical eye. Also, here's where he, uh, he's explaining to his wife that uh, the same people keep passing on the sidewalk. Um, and she's looking at him like he's crazy. Um, but he falls in love with a woman uh, named Sylvia. Uh, Sylvia, um, want, Sylvia, who's an actor, uh, but um, she's uh, like Sil Truman, she wants to tell him what's really going on and free him from his captivity. But when the authorities find out what she's up to, she's whisked away and fired be sure, before she can reveal the truth to him. Obsessed with memories of Sylvia, of Sylvia, Truman secretly creates collages using parts of images of women clipped from fashion magazines as if he might thereby be able to find her. His desire for Sylvia dovetails with his yearning to travel beyond Sea Haven. Fiji, where he wants to go, uh, I interpret as a place of erotic freedom. Sylvia is his muse a personification of creative imagination. She animates his inchoate urge to escape the humdrum uh, and, to, uh, and arouses his erotic focus and motivation. She, or the idea of she, enables Truman to break out, to dare to break out. She is the projected personification of his mostly unconscious feeling that there's something beyond the boundaries of Sea Haven something he's drawn to erotically as Dante was drawn to Beatrice. After several attempts to escape are thwarted by the show's producers, Truman manages to steal a sailboat and set off across the water separating Sea Haven from the world beyond. The show's creator, Christoph, orders up a terrific storm to discourage him, but the now undaunted Truman sails on, and finally, after the storm is allowed to subside, his, bus his vessel uh, bumps into a wall painted to simulate blue sky. At this point, Christoph speaks to him, his disembodied voice like that of God. He tries to convince Truman that there is no reality more real than that of Sea Haven beyond the wall, but Truman will have none of it. A, sh a short flight of stairs near the prow of his boat leads to a door marked exit. He ascends and opens the door, which reveals not ordinary reality you might have expected, but only complete darkness. Briefly, we cut to a picture of Sylvia watching her television in great excitement. She gathers up a few things and runs out to meet Truman, who finally bids adieu and goes out into the unconstructed unknown. So if you think about how artists are educated today, it becomes clear that 
uh, what sort of allegory the Truman Show is. Uh, a tru a tu there's a two-sided program that trains the artist's consciousness. On the one side, they learn criticality. They study theorists like Michel Foucault and Jacques Derrida and learn that reality is totally, inescapably constructed. From day one, all people begin to internalize the imperatives of the apparatus of law, education, medicine, gender roles, the economy, and for artists, the art system all of which are encoded in, la in the language we use to describe our world and to communicate with others. The artist learns to cultivate a hyper-suspicious relationship to this reality, uh, in, in, whose interest, in whose interest is what we take for reality constructed the way it is. The artist looks for clues, instances where when the apparatus gives it itself away, when what is supposed to appear naturally uncomplicatedly real, inadvertently exposes its own artificiality. The artist looks for gaps in the map, possible exits to uncharted territory. On the other hand, at the same time, uh, sometimes at the same time, the artist cultivates intuitions of possibly unconstructed experience. The movie allegor allegorizes two ways of doing this. One is the way of the visionary image maker. In making collages of female faces, Truman tries to bring into being, to make real, a woman who would, like Dante's Beatrice, lead him out of ego consciousness to cosmic consciousness. The other way is that of systems like Buddhism that recommend emptying the mind of all constructions to the end of entering into what some have called pure conscious experience. If you think of Sea Haven as a metaphor of Truman's own constructed consciousness, then when he goes out the exit door, he is, in effect, shedding his constructions. There's nothing visible through the door because nothing represented by visual imagery could be a construction, because anything represented by visual imagery would be a construction of human and necessarily uh, subcosmic consciousness. So three alternatives are conspicuously in play in contemporary art. The way of critique exposes the arbitrary, non-natural reality re projected by the media and by institutions and effectively prompts questions like, if not this, then what? Uh, this is a piece by Barbara Kruger, uh, who's one of the more uh, uh, better known artists who, who raised um, concerns about the idea of the artwork as, as uh, simply a commodity in the capitalist system, uh, traveling under the guise of this kind of romantic ethos, uh, of this re religiosity about art. Um, the visionary way, which draws on the deep uh, what, what, we, what is thought of as the deep unconscious for imagery of a reality beyond the reach of conventional, conventional representations uh, takes as its guide to cosmic reality quasi-divine or magical figures. Uh, it's something you see a great deal of in, in contemporary art today um, and in a movie like uh, Avatar. Uh, this kind of uh, evocation of some sort of neo-pagan um, possibility. Uh, on a more abstract level, this, uh, let's see, this is by Inca Essenhai. Uh, this is Al Held, uh, uh, which suggests a kind of uh, substrate of cosmic reality. <clears throat> by the way, no nothing... Uh, in showing these works, and when I come to talk about psychedelics, I'm not claiming that these artists personally took psychedelics and therefore made this kind of uh, work. I'm, I'm claiming that uh, our culture got dosed by psychedelia uh, big time in the mid-60s, and, and so we're all kind of participating in this psychedelic cultural flux. Uh, th another alternative... <clears throat> um, It's the idea it, it was um, various approaches to minimalism, which when, radi uh, when radically non-referential models or uh, precipitates Zen-like states of pure consciousness, or a, 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 a initially a kind of pure consciousness of the immediate 
uh, time and space uh, that the viewer is in without reference to, without any representational reference to anything outside of that. Um, uh, this is one of my favorite examples of this. It's uh, from 1966. N uh, Walter DeMaria's New York Earth Room, which is a um, permanent installation. Uh, I forget where it is, but it, uh, it's nothing but a gallery that's filled about two feet deep with dirt. And um, you can go up to the door and stand where the uh, plastic uh, keeps it in. And it's it's a very strange uh, thing. Uh, DeMaria's most uh, famous piece is his lightning field, um, which is in the desert of, uh, if I recall correctly, it's in Arizona. And there are these tall spikes laid out in a grid. And you go there, and you commit to staying for 24 hours. And if you're lucky, a storm comes along, and you get this great display of uh, celestial lightning bolts. Uh, I always wonder, uh, I, I imagine people, this would be a great place to trip. Um, <laughs> set and setting, you know. Um, uh, a fourth possibility, uh, not figured in the movie, um, but I think it, it's another alternative, uh, would be uh, the idea that if, when Truman goes out, he actually goes out into nature, because culture is all the constructed, the constructed environment, then the alternative is nature, which uh, in theory maybe is, un is not constructed. Um, so perhaps you might have a, a recrudescence of something like uh, what Ralph Walt Waldo Emerson was, uh, how he perceived nature, or the Hudson River School painters perceiving nature as uh, having some kind of uh, being, uh, as divinity being Im Im imminent in nature. Um, the, uh, uh, sort of a twist on that is uh, the rise of photorealism uh, in, near the end of the 60s. This is uh, Richard Estes. Um, I, I, don't know, I, I, I don't know if I'm the first person to say this in print, but I can't help but think when looking at this that it has the sort of hyper clarity that that one sometimes experiences on hallucinogens. Uh, again, I don't know if, if Estes uh, was inspired by that experience, but the culture was producing images of the world uh, that had this kind of um, hyper-real uh, look to it. And then, the, and then there, there is art. This is an artist named Warren Isensee, a more uh, a recent painting, where uh, he I actually, he's one artist that I spoke to and uh, who described some amazing uh, tripping that he did in the early 70s. And I said to him, well, what, how did that, how did your experience with psychedelics affect your work ultimately? And he, he thought it was basically color, uh, that the intensity of color that he saw. Um, and this slide is not a bad, not too bad a representation, but to see one of these paintings in person is, uh, I think, one of, one of my um, uh, th thoughts about art is that any work of art is nudging you into a state of consciousness that is uh, perhaps not what you bring, what you would ordinarily have in the everyday world. So, so actually to see this, to confront a painting like this is to see color in, in a way that uh, most of the time you don't, and, and in a uh, far more intense way. Um, I'm going to talk a little back, uh, go back prior to the 60s. Uh, I've been, the images I'm show, I've shown so far and some of the ones to follow are, are quite various. Prior to 1965, it was, and, and that variousness has been called for, for want of a better term, postmodernism, which is just art historians' way of throwing up their hands and saying, we don't know what it is, call it postmodernism. My, the book I, I wrote, I, I had this intuition or this hunch that there was something connecting this, this kind of root system of, of values and beliefs and uh, myths that, that all these different kinds of works that look so different 
uh, were fed uh, by, by underground springs that had something to do with, with the psychedelic revolution. Prior to 1965, it was the rule for critics to try to identify just one supremely significant approach to art making, one approach by which the artist could rebel against the kind of synthetic, consumerist modern world that uh, years later, Sea Haven would so vividly represent in The Truman Show. In the 50s, it was abstract expressionist painting. <clears throat> And one of the canonical texts explaining the ethos of abstract expressionism was written by uh, the art critic Harold Rosenberg. In 1952, Rosenberg published a soon-to-be-famous essay called The American Action Painters. It includes this often quoted observation, quote, at a certain point, at a certain moment, the canvas began to appear to one American painter after another as an arena in which to act rather than as a space in which to reproduce, redesign, analyze, or express an object, actual or imagined. What was to go on the canvas was not a picture, but an event. The painter no longer approached the easel with an image in mind. He went up to it with the material in hand to do something to that other piece of material in front. The image would be the result of that encounter. In a sense, uh, I think what he's saying is the, that the, the artist is a kind of graffitiist, uh, leaving his signature that testifies to the simple fact, uh, or as some might see it, the, the existentially uh, tragic fact that his body was here and there, here or there. I, I imagine, uh, well, I'm thinking that if Truman was an abstract expressionist uh, in that mode, he'd go around Sea Haven violating, uh, doing things to, uh, acting out his impulses in that place uh, as a way to subvert, to rebel and to subvert. In 1960, another influential critic, Clement Greenberg, identified modern art making as a process of criticism in which creating an artwork was like, like a painting would involve a series of corrective actions based on critical assessment of its state at any given moment. Judge and adjust, judge and adjust. That's how it goes when you're trying to make a better painting. But exactly what are you judging? Uh, you're judging the evolving quality of the artwork in terms strictly appropriate to the genre you're working in. And here's uh, one of Greenberg's money quotes. The essence of modernism lies, as I see it, in the use of, of characteristic methods of a discipline to criticize the discipline itself, not in order to subvert it, but in order to entrench it more firmly in its area of competence." End quote. This was the way to make art that would be more than just trivially entertaining in a time when a tsunami of trivial entertainment threatened to swamp contemporary culture. As Greenberg saw it, for art to establish its intellectual importance, it needed to show, quote, not only that which was unique and irreducible in art in general, but also that which was unique and irreducible in each particular art. In the case of painting, that was flatness and color and how flat shapes could be organized. And, and, and one of the best ways to do that was stripes. Uh, this is a painting by Kenneth Nolan. Um, so he said, each art had to determine through its own operation and works the effect exclusive to itself. By doing so, it would, to be sure, narrow its area of competence, but at the same time, it would make possession of that area all the more certain. So there was this kind of scientistic, specializing idea about uh, where art was going, uh, or how art might become increasingly uh, uh, high quality and, and, and separate it more, more so from the dreck and kitsch and junk of, okay. Um, so uh, then came the psychedelic revolution which spawned a terrifically energetic psychedelic culture which embraced the music, uh, well, you know, all, you know what it embraced. Uh, psychedelia grew so popular as to become almost synonymous with mainstream entertainment. Meanwhile, the character of cutting edge visual art underwent a paradigmatic change. No longer was art something just to appreciate for its aesthetic qualities. 
Traditional kind of sorship was out. Consciousness altering, altering experience was in. Uh, boundaries between uh, conventional media uh, became fluid and porous. And uh, I'm going to show a bunch of some slides uh, just to give a sense of the sort of uh, uh, pluralism that I'm talking about. This is R. Crumb. This is an artist named Jim Iserman. Uh, Mandala shows up over and over again in, in art since the 60s, something that you didn't see that much of prior to the 60s. Um, so in my, in my book, art, uh, Are You Experienced?, I contend that the widespread consumption of consciousness-altering drugs uh, had something to do with transformations in modern art that happened around uh, in the mid-60s. So, um, I just, this is an example of, of what uh, I think of as art history's uh, shameful neglect of this whole topic. I, this is a Ro uh, Robert Smithson's most famous piece, Spiral Jetty. Uh, a few weeks ago, somebody uh, told me, and, and I've read a bunch of uh, Robert Smithson, his writing his, uh, is about as trippy, it's the most trippy writing uh, you'll ever read about anything having to do with contemporary art. And um, w it's clear that he, he was uh, tripping and stoned and, doing, uh, and coming out of that mindset. But I went to, to college in the, in the 19, early 70s, studied art history. I've never heard anyone say anything about that, that, doing, that doing a lot of psychedelics had anything to do with the kind of art that Smithson made. But I recently found out that he died, he fell out of an airplane when he was uh, working on his last piece. Uh, I forget what it's called, but it was something along these lines. And somebody said he was tripping when he fell out of the plane. And uh, I, asked, I asked around, and I have it now on pretty good authority that he was tripping, uh, which I think is a wonderfully mythic um, story, a kind of Daedalus uh, thing. But. Um, So, uh, so the the myth. Uh, so, what one of the things I want to say is that what what people think people sometimes say art lost its mind in the '60s. I think what really happened is art art got its mind back, because what I've described Greenberg and Rosenberg talking about is art without mind. Art uh, either art that's pure object, pure perfect object, or art just as a kind of action. Uh, so what happened when, when the 60s, when the re psychedelic revolution came along, suddenly mind and consciousness started to seem really interesting, uh, as it did not seem to philosophers in the 1950s who thought we could dispense with the whole concept of mind as a metaphysical construct that was not useful in parsing uh, important analytic problems. Uh, so mind becomes the, the new frontier, and um, I think I, I, that what the, the result of that is that all the usual standards for judging what makes interesting art are, are, are no longer apply. People are making too many different kinds of things to be able to compare them, so it comes down to, uh, for the viewer, how much does this particular rabbit hole uh, how deeply does it affect my uh, sense of the world, my consciousness? So I think today's artist is not a humanist in uh, the old sense, but a mystic seeker, uh, whether he knows it or not. Most people, want, most artists are, are modest enough not to uh, speak in these kind of high-flown terms, but, uh, but I think if you, and if you look at art now collectively, it's a kind of neo-Gnostic revolution uh, of seeking in every conceivable direction without any preconceived dogma. Um, what's the nature of that uh, knowledge? Uh, could, uh, could it be that uh, there's an experience of divine mind trying to make itself known to us? Divine or cosmic mind? Cosmic, if cosmic mind reveals itself to us, how does that happen? The Sufi philosopher Ibn Arabi proposed that there are three levels of reality, the terrestrial, uh, the, con uh, the undifferentiated, and the undifferentiated all, 
uh, are two, but in between those two is the realm of theophany, where cosmic or divine mind is embodied in visible but not materially concrete forms. The medium of these visionary manifestations is the imagination. They are produced in and by theophanic imagination. Theophanic imagination is the organ through which divine mind speaks. Everyone has imagination, but few people have a highly developed theophanic imagination. William Blake had it in spades. Enough to make you wonder if he might have uh, been sam uh, doing psych uh, psilocybin mushrooms, which grew, which grow uh, naturally in England. Um, I guess it's possible that one of the things that psychedelic drugs do is to trigger that function which remains dormant in most people, so that almost anyone can experience theophanic manifestations of divine, divine mind. All existence is a theophany of divine mind, but in some things the divine is more veiled than in others. The material world is cloaked in an opaque veil. Theophanic images are veiled in translucent garments. Artworks combine both. They are material objects perceptible to the five senses, and to those who have developed theophanic imagination, they can be manifestations of cosmic mind, and as such can be touchstones that orient us to, quote, ultimate reality. Still, most of us, most of us are most of the time asleep. Uh, just imagine uh, your... I th going through these quickly, I think, is a good way to get a sense of just how nuts uh, art is these days, um, in the best possible sense. Um, this, this is the, uh, I'm, at an, I'm, I'm, I'm at the end here. Um, I think it is useful to think that art today, what, that what art is doing today, haphazardly, idiosyncratically, non-programmatically, uh, um, without controlled studies, is to help people develop theophanic imagination, to create a matrix in which divine mind can become apparent, where the veil of perception becomes transparent. I think it was the psychedelic revolution that redirected art onto this path. That does not mean that many people see art this way. My, theor my theory hasn't gotten a lot of traction in the academy yet. Um, not many people see the action of divine mind in the matrix of art. So, but I think, if I think of uh, when I, my ego is most inflated, I think that my job as an art critic is to try to describe the experience of art as an experience in and of theophanic imagination. If there's such a thing as psychedelic art criticism, that's what I'd like to be doing. Thanks. That was wonderful. Um, questions, comments? Hi. Um, as someone getting my PhD in psychedelic art, I wanted to thank you profusely for your long overdue book. I was really happy to find something published on the subject. Um, I had a few questions, though. Um, it seems like most of the book was written from the perspective of the academy as it currently exists. And I thought it was interesting that you only have three um, kind of aside references to Alex Gray, and um, you end with a kind of an open question about a new paradigm coming in. So I was wondering why um, you didn't include um, some of the visionary art that, for example, MAPS uses as fundraisers that are being painted by people who actively identify as mystic seekers. Um, if that well, I, because, is this work? Because I, I, if I understand your question, why, why, didn't, why didn't I show more typically uh, psychedelic looking art and art uh, by people like Alex Gray who, who are very public about their mission as psychedelic artists? Is that, because I, my problem f the, uh, within the world I operate in, the art world, psychedelic art <coughs> is thought of <coughs> as a niche and not a very interesting niche. And <clears throat> so I wanted to show that not only is the kind of art you're talking about, there's that kind of psychedelic art. Isaac Abrams is another. 
but that the psychedelic kind of uh, uh, there's a psychedelic heartbeat that goes through all different kinds of art that that the the confusing diversity of art can be explained uh, by uh, this sort of ethos that's been uh, with us now for at least 50 years in in a mainstream way no longer as an underground uh, thing but um, pretty overtly but but with with the uh, idea that that drugs are involved uh, especially within the art world not something that you're a lot really that anybody talks about oh um, this is one of one of my th 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 ideas is that uh, th that there's never been in human history a time when um, humor or uh, the comic m mode was so predominant. I mean, hu this is Maurizio Catalan, uh, Pope felled by a meteor, and um, it's a it's a high <coughs> it's a highly realistic uh, sculpture made by uh, f fabricators that he hired, uh, and. Catalan's one of the most uh, significant artists in the contemporary art world today. He's soon to have a major retrospective at the Guggenheim Museum. He makes stoner jokes. You know, why hasn't anybody noticed? And that's true of an awful lot of art uh, these days. Um, this is by Judith Linares, just a painter I happen to love. Uh, um, uh, Damien Hirst. Uh, an actual stuffed shark. I think this is a piece about death. I think it's called the, the impossibility of death in the mind of someone still living. And I think uh, there's an element of death consciousness in contemporary art, which has, to, I mean, what's the ultimate, truly, completely unconstructed experience? It would be death, as far as we know, uh, or maybe not. Um, uh, this is Jeff Koons. This sculpture is 10 feet tall at its highest point. This is on the roof of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. If this is psychedelic, then he, uh, you know, we live. In, then art is psychedelic, and uh, these. Th this is made out of stainless steel, uh, lacquered to uh, a golden perfection, and. Uh, uh, another artist I know named Carol Dunham tells, said to me he thinks Jeff Koons' work is, uh, quote, alarmingly psychedelic. Um, but I think of it as like, you know, you think of like what thing, how intense things can look uh, under the influence of different hallucinogens and also how, how scale can change. This is uh, by uh, an artist named Charles Ray who... Uh, all these figures are four feet tall, and their 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 proportions are right. So, he's an artist that that has also made work actually uh, explicitly under the influence of. There, there's a there's a photo. Uh, he made a piece that's a self portrait, and it's installed on a curved wall. You don't notice it's curved at first, and it's a self portrait and. He, the text or the, what the verbal explanation is that he was tripping when he took this photograph and um, it's called Yes. Uh, this is called Family Romance. Um, but weird changes in scale, you know, the Alice in Wonderland kind of effect is something you see in art all the time. And uh, it, it, it seems the, the relationship of that to, to psychedelic experience seems to me I mean, part of my th idea was that artists who are really prominent now are about my age, maybe a little younger. They lived at a time when I was a teenager growing up, and uh, when the psychedelic revolution and the culture it created hit, it was it was just it was amazing to people then in a way that that's a young person tripping for the first time now. I don't think can uh, can imagine because. Now you have a whole, you have uh, a culture that explains, uh, you have a whole semiotic systems that explain why, you know, what hallucin, what, what, the, what every single kind of drug does and what it's good for. And the idea that it is good for something is pretty uh, well installed in, in most well-educated young people. Um, I love this. 
I, I, in my book, I said, imagine you're out with your friends uh, driving around, smoking weed, and you come across this billboard. <laughs> and you go like, let's see, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, high. You know, it's like, it's a, and you're high, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's a piece by uh, Kay Rosen, who, who does wonderful, kind of a co concrete poet, really. This is a piece by Tom Friedman. Uh, it's 5,000 pieces of, of bubble gum that he, that he chewed and, and fashioned into this cantaloupe-sized cantaloupe ball and put it in, in a corner. This comes back to humor because it looks like a piece of pure minimalist sculpture, uh, but then all this other stuff kind of, it's, it's another stoner dro uh, joke, really. Um, this was a big show at the, in the atrium at the Museum of Modern Art, Pipilotti Wrist. Uh, the walls dissolved in these intense, uh, uh, very psychedelic video imagery. Uh, and people lounged around on, on this round sofa. And I th when I was growing, a teenager, f friends who had really permissive parents, they had uh, their rooms, they had black lights in their rooms and day glow posters, and they turned their rooms, not, they didn't just decorate their rooms, they transformed their rooms into these uh, environments for, uh, for being stoned in. And it's, I wonder, is it an accident that 20 years later installation art became, they were creating installation art as teenagers, and, and now that uh, would become a very uh, important art form. Um, as I was going through these slides, I thought, as I was thinking about the spiral, uh, this is Richard Serra. He, he makes these lead, uh, uh, sculptures made out of rolled steel that you enter into, and the walls, uh, uh, they flop and wooze, and um, they, they disorient you in space and time. Um, I think prior to the 60s, the, probably the foundational kind of structure was the grid. Think of someone like Mondrian. Um, and, and now the, the, the spiral uh, is, a, is a very recurrent um, kind of thing, P partly be maybe because spirals is, are, often appear to people when they're tripping. Uh, it also has a certain kind of symbolic uh, idea about spiritual evolution. This is Philip Taft. This is Bruce Nauman. Uh, I love this. The true artist helps the world by, by uh, revealing mystic truths. So this is a piece by a true artist revealing to us a mystic truth. And the mystic truth is that the true artist reveal, helps the world by revealing mystic truths. It's, it's very stoner very appealing to stoner consciousness because it's this meta thing. It's talking about itself, uh, which is, uh, you see an awful lot of in, in today's culture. Um, one last spiral. Uh, by Tom Friedman, a uh, spiral made, uh, made of pubic hair on a bar of soap. That's all I got. Uh,